now. Okay, I'm gonna welcome our president of the board of directors of the Friends of Balcones. And Wayne is going to also give you a personal welcome here and walk you through the agenda. Wayne, it's all yours. Wow, thank you, Paula. Welcome everyone. Again, thanks for joining us for this uh, 2020 virtual membership meeting of the Friends of Balcones Candylands National Wildlife Refuge. That is a mouthful, but that is our name. As Paula says, I'm Wayne Collins. I have had the privilege and the pleasure of serving as president for this Friends Group. Uh, to say the least, this has been a year of surprises. We certainly hope you and your family and friends have remained um, Wayne, could you speak up a little bit, please? Okay, is that better? Thank you. Uh, we, uh, we certainly hope you and your family, friends, have remained healthy during this time of uncertainty and that we remain or that you remain that way until things get back to normal, whatever that is. Both refuge staff and the Friends Board of Directors and its new committees have been very busy. We've actually accomplished a, a lot and we're very excited to be able to tell you more about that. So as you see on your screen, the agenda, uh, we'll have a update uh, from, from uh, refuge staff, Kelly Perkey, our refuge manager, Jennifer Brown, the visitor services education ranger uh, we will provide uh, some time for questions and answers after that. We want to introduce a new board candidate, Ryan Beach. Uh, Dave Bell will, will uh, talk about him briefly. Uh, we are uh, excited about a new fall fundraiser. We're going to get involved with the Giving Tuesday. Fred Zacks will give us details on that. Paula Richards will then showcase our long range strategic plan. And then we'll, we'll uh, throw in some more time for questions and answers. Uh, I, this, is a, this is a member meeting. We have a lot of people to recognize and be thankful for. After that, uh, Dave Bell will lead us through a, a member vote for our new bylaws. And uh, then we'll just close that with some comments. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. Kelly Perkey is our refuge manager. Jennifer Brown is the visitor services manager. Welcome ladies, you have the screen. Good morning, everyone. Um, it is an honor and a privilege to be with you this morning. I'm Kelly Perkey. I'm the refuge manager at Balcones Canyonland National Wildlife Refuge and our visitor services lead, Jennifer Brown, will um, also be presenting with me this morning. We wanna start out with, uh, we are the Balcones Canyonland National Wildlife Refuge. And what does that mean? Well, next slide, please. Um, we are part of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, so we're the federal um, wildlife management uh, agency versus your local or your state. Um, and our mission is working with others to conserve, protect, and enhance fish, wildlife, and plants and their habitats for the continuing benefit of the American people. Next slide, please. We are one of over 550 national wildlife refuges across the country to include Alaska, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, and um, others in the Pacific. So, um, so one of many. Next slide, please. And how do we become the Balcones Canyonland National Wildlife Refuge? Well, there are these two very special birds um, on the right, the black cap vireo, um, they were uh, listed by the um, Endangered Species Act um, in 1987, and then um, in 1990, they was the 
they also saw the need to protect the one on the left, and that's the golden cheek warbler. And um, so there was a lot of effort that went forth to how do we, as the federal government, support what needs to be done locally. So um, next slide, please. Um, you know, some of the, the best strategy is, is land protection. And so um, in the recovery plan, they, um, this is actually the, the Golden Sheik Warblers recovery plan information. Um, you can see on the right, what they did was they um, designated these, these protection areas where they wanted to have individual populations. And they figured if they had eight separate distinct populations, um, this was back in the 1992 plan, that that would be um, enough or sufficient to maintain the species um, for a hundred years. And that's the criteria for endangered species. So, um, and they're looking to try to protect a total of 32,500 acres um, in a contiguous block is, is the goal. So next slide, please. So in 1992, Congress authorized the Balcones Canyonlands National Wildlife Refuge. And in that authorizing legislation, our purpose was to provide for a sufficient representation of golden cheek warblers and black cap vireos, also watershed and water quality protection. Um, and, in, and in the protection for the, for the birds, that was also to um, try and uh, acquire potentially um, destroyed a fragmented nesting habitat and also to provide a buffer zone. Um, and specifically in that legislation, Congress said, here's an 80,000 acre area with, in which you can acquire land, but in that 80,000 acre acquisition boundary, um, you can only acquire up to 46,000. So what does that look like? Um, next slide, please. And so as you can see, um, the kind of grayed out area is what was designated as our acquisition boundary. And then, um, and then based on the legislation, we can acquire up to 46,000 acres within there. However, right now, um, we're at about 22,000. And as you can see, we have a little bit of a puzzle piece thing going on because we only um, buy from willing sellers. Um, and then, of course, we're in portions of Burnett, Williamson, and Travis County. We do also have um, a little over 5,000 acres in conservation easements where um, the land is protected, but um, still privately owned. Um, but that helps us to, to prevent development in those areas. So next slide, please. Um, so we are not, so I, I, something that has come up a few times this year, and so I thought it was worth mentioning, there's also the BCP, or the Balcones Canyonland Preserve. And so what that is, is it's basically the local um, reaction to the, to the endangered species land protection that's needed in the Austin area. And what that did was that it created a plan called a Habitat Conservation Plan that is a way that um, land can be set aside um, and it stream, it's in an area and it streams, streamlines the development process for um, the contractors that are looking in the Austin area. And so as you can see on the map to the right, um, the BCP is kind of south of Lake Travis um, in the Austin area and we're up to the northwest of that. And so, so we have a lot of the same goals. They are, there are two distinct populations that are trying to be protected for golden cheek warblers. Um, and, but however, we're completely separate. They're local managed by the city of Austin and Travis County and obviously we have, we're federal. So just, just wanted to make that distinction. So next slide, please. Um, but here at Balcones Canyonland National Wildlife Refuge, we are wildlife first. Um, and that's the, in the National Wildlife Refuge Improvement Act of 1997, that's, that's what the, the system says that we are. However, our, we do have people priorities and our people priorities 
are wildlife observation, photography, interpretation, environmental education, and hunting. Um, nationally, the other one is fishing, but because we don't have a whole lot of water on the refuge, we don't really have fishing. So, um, But we have a, a bunch of awesome, great things to see and do on the refuge. And so um, I'm glad that uh, you're here supporting us with that mission. So next slide, please. Um, we do have some challenges. Um, land protection and conservation, um, that's always going to be a challenge, especially as Austin continues and, and the surrounding areas continue to expand. Um, funding and personnel. Um, the For those that don't know, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is a little small agency within the federal government. It's so small that our entire budget is less than that of the military marching band. So, um, so we struggle with that. And um, but but we have awesome people like the Friends Group that support us, and we do the best we can with what we have. Um, obviously, this year one of our challenges was COVID nineteen, um, and and it was a challenge because. Um, you know, we stayed open, but yet we weren't allowed to be there. So, but I have to say, I'm super excited and impressed with the people that, that live in and around Austin because they used the heck out of the refuge, but they actually were very respectful and, um, and I think enjoyed it versus destroyed it as you see in some other places. So, um, so we had um, just unprecedented visitation this year. So, so that, that was also a good thing as well. So next slide. Just an example of how urbanization and or land protection is important. One of the things that's happening out in this part of the world is, um, so we have this nice contiguous um, forested woodland and then um, they, they put a road through it because they're about to build the neighborhood. So, um, or you have this beautiful hillside that um, has nice wooded trees on it, great golden sheep habitat, and but then it's turned into um, a, a place with some houses. And I can tell you, you know, beautiful views and and nice places to live, but um, it makes all these things are management challenges because they create um, create fragmentation. They create a situation where um, the houses become fire hazard. So, um, so these are, so these are some of our challenges that we continue to have. Next slide, please. And so this is just this is a this actually is a current map. And so one of the things this is highlighting is is that. I think when they set aside this this acquisition boundary land, the um, they were thought we were out in the middle of nowhere. However, um, you can see as these cities have grown, they're basically all growing toward us. So um, now more than ever, is it important to protect the land because um, there's the the potential for development is very high. And so we're, we're constantly trying to make sure that, that the refuge is intact and that habitat is protected forever. Next slide, please. So um, funding and personnel, like I said, we're, uh, you know, we're always, we're always looking for fun, looking for funding. Um, more funding. We do the best with we can with what we have. Um, but the, I have to say that the the friends group support is com is totally invaluable because you know the funding isn't just um, you know it, it, what it does is it covers people and you know it's hard to get work done if you don't have people to do them and so just the volunteer hours that are brought to the refuge actually were equivalent to six and a half permanent full-time positions last year. And that is unprecedented. I mean, that, that basically doubles my staff. And so without that, you know, we could not do what we do along with um, they've helped with our land acquisition program and 
Um, they have done things like built our um, outdoor education pavilion. So um, I, I don't know what I would do if I didn't have such an awesome friends group supporting us. Next slide, please. And so everyone asks what my vision is. And, and I think that what I have a hard time with the vision because the bottom line is, is that I want us to be the best. I want us to be the best um, in habitat management. I want us to be doing cutting edge, interesting research. Um, I want the visitor experience that everyone has to be the most high quality, best experience that they have. And I want us to be known nationwide for the conservation that we're doing. And so um, I think that that that's what we're striving for in every aspect of what we do is. And so um, we are making strides every year. And in fact, um, next slide, please. Jennifer Brown, the lead from Visitor Services is going to talk about all of our successes and I will turn it over to her. Hi everyone, thanks so much for allowing us to be here and talk to you about the refuge and all of the work that we get to do together with the Friends of Balconies. So as Kelly mentioned, um, coronavirus has really thrown us for a loop. Uh, this time, um, this part of this year, we never thought it would look this way <laughs> as we were planning for, for from last year. So. One thing that's been really great is people have been using public lands. They have been going out and finding refuge for people in our National Wildlife Refuge. And when you're stuck at home and you're stressed out because you're, you can't see your friends and family as much as you'd like, being able to go out and breathe some fresh air um, and connect to nature has really helped folks. And as you can see from our visitation numbers, we have gone up 66% in visitation from last year to this year. As I've been here the past several years, our visitation has increased, but this is a enormous increase. So we're very happy to be able to pro provide that refuge, not only for plants and wildlife, but also for the visiting public in our community. And one interesting thing is that I um, have been working with the Friends of Balconies and with other refuge staff on projects um, for the past several years. And some of them, though we didn't mean for this to happen, are really great for the public to be able to self-orient themselves along the refuge, to be able to um, read a sign and get information or see a map and know how to um, take the best Part of the trail for them with our headquarters area and visitor contact station being closed uh, through coronavirus this has unexpectedly been a great time for all these projects to come to fruition so uh, i'm excited to tell you about some of them so if you would move to the next si slide please one very exciting new project is expanding the parking lot at doskin ranch and the paint is just drying right now on these new stripes. So thank you so much to volunteers and the refuge maintenance crew who expanded this parking lot by 27 spots. Now, any of you who have volunteered during our field trip season when we bring students out to do environmental education can uh, remember how difficult it was to find a parking spot and um, how some people on the weekends, uh, when everybody would come to hike, there may be uh, folks even parking along the highway. So everybody can have a nice, safe place to park and visit the refuge right now. And it's helpful with all that increased visitation that we're having. Would you move to the next slide, please? Another thing that the refuge has done this year is expanded our hunting opportunities. So hunting is a, um, a time-honored tradition that family members do to recreate together, to provide food for their family. And in Texas, we don't have a lot of public lands available for hunting. And so the average person maybe not be, may not be able to afford an expensive um, hunting lease on private property. So having a place nearby where you can um, hunt 
and recreate with your family and pass down those traditions is, is a nice thing that we can offer the public. And it also helps us to manage populations of feral hogs and deer on the refuge. So this year, we're very excited to have our first archery hunt, an archery only hunt on 640 acres that we opened up for this purpose. We partnered with Texas Parks and Wildlife Department so that hunters who purchase the annual public hunting permit could um, then put their name in the hat of a lottery and then 10 people were chosen from that lottery to be able to hunt on that property for the month of October. We've also this year expanded hunting acres for our regular big game hunt by about a thousand acres and stay tuned for next year. There'll be um, some more acres that we'll be able to expand for that hunt. And then in September, we also have a dove hunt every year, which also went very well. Will you move to the next slide, please? Now, one of those things that is helping the public self-orient themselves where they don't have to see a, a volunteer or, or me in the visitor center to find their way around is this really fun new app. So we're connecting um, the refuge to kids through technology. So the Agents of Discovery app is a game which features augmented reality where you can um, download this app and then hike on the Creek Trail at Doskin Ranch with your phone and be able to um, play different challenges. As you hike along the trail, you stop and you will learn about pollinators and you'll learn about water and you learn about endangered species. So it's a, a way to engage students in a different way, students and children. So make sure that you download the Agents of Discovery app for your kids or your grandkids, or even you know adult kids who wanna play and try out this new fun game. Will you move to the next slide, please? So next we have another app that just dropped about a month ago. So we just opened this up. It's called the Discover Nature app. And the Discover Nature app is geared more towards adults where we have our refuge hiking trail system on this app that you can download and view from your home. So you don't have to be on the refuge in order to use this app, although you can also use it while you're on the refuge. And we feature lots of virtual interpretive signage on the app. So you can press different waypoints on the trails and uh, information will pop up like this photo of the sunset deck and it tells you, you know, is this good for wheelchairs? Is this good for wildlife observation? And um, some other really cool things about this Discover Nature app is that you can upload your wildlife sightings into it. So I'm very excited to see how people will be using that at Balconies. And similar to the National Park Service, the Fish and Wildlife Service has a blue goose passport. And with the Discover Nature app, you can get a virtual blue goose stamp. So if you can't get your, um, your book stamped at the headquarters, you can get it virtually stamped through this app. So we're very excited that this was released recently. Can we move to the next slide, please? This project, the new kiosks and trailhead signs, I have been working on for several years and what good timing it was that we were able to install these um, over last fall and winter. So our refuge, if you've visited Balconies before, you may remember that there are four different public areas. So if you're on one part of the refuge, uh, maybe Doskin Ranch, and you drive south to Warbler Vista, some people may not realize that they're still at Balconies Canyonlands National Wildlife Refuge. I've had visitors um, guess that they were maybe at the Balconies Canyonlands Preserve that Kelly mentioned we get mixed up with a lot, or maybe even a county park. So by having these uh, brand new kiosks that all look the same with the green roof and um, all these trailhead signs that all look very similar where combining all these public areas visually so that people will remember, oh, I'm still on the National Wildlife Refuge. And really 
some very cool things about these new trailhead signs is we have all new maps and it has a little you are here spot at each trailhead and I even put on there to take a photo of this map with your camera phone so that we can reduce the number of paper maps that we have to print. There's also, you can see a little bit on the right hand side picture, some wildlife and plant plants that you might see as you're hiking that trail. So uh, be sure to check those out the next time you visit. We move to the next slide, please. Another fun project that is finally coming to fruition is some new interpretive signs. So these two will be featured at our headquarters area and we're really excited. Some of them are being installed already. So if you move to the next slide, I wanted to give you a little preview of one that is at the sunset deck, which is at the very top of Warbler Vista. Um, it talks a lot about golden tooth warblers. Why? Uh, why are they tied to this refuge? Why is Central Texas so vital to their survival? And it's, it's really well done and I can't wait for you to see it in person. The next slide features my favorite sign. And this one will be at our headquarters area. And it's really fun because it talks about this, this part of the land through time and what used to be here and why it's important for what's here now. And I'm very excited for you guys to see this one um, coming up in the future. If you would move to the next slide, please. This is a big deal and it has been a long time coming. So big thank you to the Friends of Balcones trail crew who have created brand new trails at Warbler Vista. There's a new Quarry Canyon Trail, a brand new Boulder Trail, and the Ridgeline Trail that was already there has been doubled in size. So because of the Friends of Balcones Trail Committee, we were able to add a mile and a half of trails there at Warbler Vista. And this was no small feat. It took a couple of years because they had to scout the trails and measure the trails and build the trails. So it was a lot of work and I wanna thank you so much. We have had so much positive feedback already from the public enjoying these new trails. And if you would switch to the next slide, we had to build a new parking lot because of our new Quarry Canyon trailhead. So volunteers and our maintenance crew were able to add 12 spots um, further down the hill as you enter, enter Warbler Vista, this will be your first parking lot that you come across. It'll be on your left-hand side. And so where before we had three parking areas, now we have four. And I think this is great, not only because of our increased visitation, but in times of uh, coronavirus, where you wanna be socially distant, having different places to park. So if this first parking lot is full, you can drive up the hill and park at the next one and know that you're not starting on the trail where all these same other people are starting on the trail. So I think it's, um, it's a great new addition for so many reasons. Will you go to the next slide, please? This next project I'm very excited about. So we have just completed our brand new Balcones Canyonlands Junior Ranger booklet. And thank you to the Friends of Balcones because they are going to be printing these new booklets in the next couple of weeks. And not only do we have a brand new Junior Ranger book and program, there's going to be custom Junior Ranger badges that we have to thank you, Friends of Balcones, for also um, creating for us. So this is gonna be a really fun new program and we're gonna have volunteers at the public areas on the weekends at Warbler Vista, at Doskin Ranch, offering these for families to take and children can complete a few activities and then they'll be able to earn their junior ranger badge that day and the volunteer can swear them in as a new junior, junior ranger. And that is one of the greatest joys in my job is swearing in new junior rangers. So if you're interested in volunteering for that, um, send me an email and let me know. I'll put my, my email address in the chat box in a minute, but it's also on my last slide. Will you switch to the next slide, please? Ah, oh, and the new parts of the refuge. So 
We are so excited to have added some new acres to the refuge. I know Kelly mentioned before that Balcones Canyonlands is kind of like a puzzle and we're still putting together some of those puzzle pieces. So the crane tract is 50 acres that were added and 1000 feet of that is Cow Creek frontage. So for anybody who's ever driven from the south of the refuge to the north of the refuge or vice versa on Cow Creek Road, know how beautiful and special that um, that area is. And so, so to have a thousand feet of frontage on Cow Creek is, is really exciting. And also this would not have happened without the Friends of Balcones or it would have happened very, very slowly because the Friends of Balcones has paid for the appraisal of this property and also a lot for the survey of this property. And because it's going through the government system, the survey has to be so much more complicated and that's why it's much more expensive. And without this funding from the friends group to be able to have all of the survey and appraisal and paperwork ready, we may have missed our chance at, at purchasing this property because it takes so long to get funding for these things in the government. And uh, the willing seller of the property may have said, hey, I don't have time to wait for you know, the government to, to get all their papers together. So thank you so much for, for helping with that, Friends of Balcones. And um, the Fish and Wildlife Service will be able to reimburse the Friends Group for the survey. And coming soon to Balcones Canyonlands is the Hagenbotham Tract. Right now we are in the process of purchasing this other new tract of 262 acres. And we are speeding up the process again because the Friends of Balconies have paid for the appraisal for this. So I wanna say a big thank you for that. Will you switch it to the next slide? And so Kelly and myself and all of the staff at Balconies, we, uh, we are so proud to get to work hand in hand with the Friends of Balconies to accomplish so much good work, so much good conservation for wildlife, to offer a special place for uh, the public to visit and get refuge as well. And we're really excited for the future and all the work that we can do together. Um, and Kelly and I are also very friendly and love to talk to you. So if you have a question, a concern, you want to tell us about how your hike went one day, please feel free uh, to email us or give us a call. We'd love to hear from you. So thank you. And if you switch to the next slide, yeah, if you have any questions, we're here to help. Thanks, ladies. You know, Ken, Ken Burns put out a deal a while back about the national parks. It's, you know, the national parks, the America's best kept secret. Well, by golly, we have the Balcones Canyonlands National Wildlife Refuge, and that is a great asset for this area. So we're glad you're here. So um, are there any questions from the chat box that we want to ask of Jennifer and Kelly? Yes, I, uh, this is Dave Bell. Uh, I have a question from Claire Hempel um, for Kelly, and that Claire asks uh, if, she says, I'm curious if any part of the refuge's mission is endangered by national presidential administration decisions, as is so many other environmental uh, regulations. So the short answer is no. And, and luckily we're in a position where, um, and, and I've been through four administration changes now and, and they put laws and policies in place so that so that things are pretty stable for us. I mean, obviously, there are some decisions that are made that you may or may not support at other places. But in general, from day to day at Balcones Canyonlands National Wildlife Refuge, um, things are pretty stable and our mission and our purpose has stayed the same and is still supported throughout the system. Thanks, Kelly. Another question from James Reimer, and um, he wants to know if there's any info on Flying X plans. Um, and I guess I don't know in what respect 
the question is, so James, if you want to type in something more specific, um, in general, um, the, uh, the flying X is a place that we probably do not intend to keep the way that it is. Um, it is, I, I've joked at other friends groups meetings that it's um, my money pit. Um, but what, develop trails, that's good. Um, what I do see it as is more of, um, of us building maybe like a big outdoor pavilion out there and even maybe like having an outdoor kitchen um, where we could have, you could have meetings out there with a series of trails that that could be used, say by um, you know conservation groups or or scouts or or something like that. So um, I would say that that's probably within the next five years um, before before we before the flying X is uh, actually is removed. There's a few other things that um, honestly the Fish and Wildlife Service has been promising us here at Balconies and I want to see those things come to fruition before we specifically take action. But um, we definitely see um, more access out there, at least um, at least different use in a different way. So um, so to be continued, but, but those plans are, are definitely in the works. <clears throat> Thanks, Kelly. Uh, Chloe Crumley wants to know, is there, is there any access to the Land and Water Conservation Fund for the refuge to purchase land? That's an, that's an awesome question, Chloe. Um, just so everybody knows and understands, um, uh, recently the, oh my gosh, um, I'm going to have a moment where I don't remember exactly what the name of the legislation was, but Congress passed like an American Outdoors Act or something like that, that actually um, authorized full funding of land and water conservation um, funding. And so, um, yes, the Great American Outdoors Act. Yes, thank you. And so, so what that did um, was the way that the way that refuges get bought is there's really two funding sources. There's migratory bird funding, and then there's land and water conservation funding. And there's a few other ways, but in general, that's the big pots of money. And so um, here, one of our problems has been for land acquisition is that we don't really, migratory bird funding is really for ducks. You know, it's it comes, it's generated from duck stamps funding. And so to actually compete for migratory bird funding, you have to have some type of waterfowl and we really don't, because we don't really have water. And so land and water has always been the only source that we've had for funding. Well, um, we have been working over the last couple of years. We've gotten moved up in the prioritization of funding in general. And then now with them funding land and water conservation um, fully every year, which is what they just passed, that's going to help us tremendously. And that's I, honestly some of the way that we've been able to acquire these properties um, that, that Jennifer talked about was, is that the, you know, we, for a, a long time, we had a hard time when people would bring them to us, we'd be like, well, we appreciate, we'd really like to buy it. We appreciate that you want to sell it to us, but we don't have any money. So this has really opened up our um, possibilities for um, purchasing more properties. So, so it was actually, it actually is going to be great for us. Thanks again, Kelly. Uh, Bill Carr asked, what are the refuges plans to implement the You Belong Here program? I can take that if you want, Kelly. Go, go for it, Jen. <laughs> so that's part of our, uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is doing a rebranding and um, coming up with some new ways to communicate to the public the importance of the Fish and Wildlife Service, the things that we do, and the ways that we can connect with our community around us. And so some refuges are located near urban areas like Balconies, we're pretty close to the Austin area. 
And so there is a, um, you belong here as part of a greater program with this uh, new branding that we're doing. And it's already begun, Bill. So there are, there's funds that came from our headquarters office to help us to implement this. And very uh, luckily for us, we were awarded a couple of them. So we'll be getting a intern to work with us for nine months next year to help implement um, this part of the program. So good question. Okay, that covers all the questions we have to the moment. Thank you. Thanks ladies. Thank you, Dave. Thank, Thank you. Questions. Uh, I think Paula said earlier, we're going to be posting everything as soon as possible. We can send you a link uh, in case you want to review. Next, uh, Dave Bell is going to introduce a uh, new board candidate. Okay, I want to um, introduce Ryan Beach, who is in this meeting. You can see his smiling face if you scroll down through all the places there. And um, I just want to, I, I just want to say that um, Fred Zag, Fred Zags nominated Ryan and Ryan had spent quite a, quite a bit of time and effort working with Fred and the finance committee. Um, Ryan worked uh, also with me and with Dan Nugent on the trails committee uh, doing trail maintenance and trail building. And, and he was one of the guys that was responsible for those two new trails that um, Jennifer just described. So I'm going to introduce him. Um, he served on several boards and committees while he was employed at USAA. He had, and he is an Air Force Academy graduate and a Falcon Scholar Award winner. Wave your hand there, Ryan. And I promise I will not tell anyone what the new nickname for you that was uh, generated by the Trails Committee is. <laughs> Thanks, Wayne. All right, thank you, Dave. Yeah, Ryan brings his area of expertise in financial matters to the board that uh, we're expecting will be very beneficial as we move through our various phases of our long range plan. Uh, we look forward to his contributions and his service. We always have openings for anyone interested in getting involved, be a board member, committee chair, committee member, you know, I, I kind of look at myself as a board junkie sometimes, but, but by golly, we get a chance to, to get active, get involved, meet people and learn stuff. So we have a great group of volunteers. We have a super refuge staff as, as you can attest to. Uh, so speaking for myself, it's been a lot of work, but a lot of fun, pure joy to work with the whole team. I encourage everyone to, to get involved. So next, we're going to hear from Fred. He's our committee chair for fundraising. We're looking at a new approach and are really excited with the process and the possibilities. Take it away, Fred. All right. So glad to have 33 people attending the meeting. It's great for the annual meeting. Uh, just a quick update on what we're doing. Giving Tuesday, the whole concept was started in 2012. And it's a worldwide event, as a lot of y'all are familiar with. You see it promoted on the news, that type of stuff, of just getting out there and giving, whether it's volunteering, whether it's uh, bringing your neighbor uh, out to the refuge and exposing them to a, a neat afternoon, hiking the trails, uh, or if it's a financial uh, contribution. Giving Tuesday is just about somehow of us giving thanks for what we have and uh, showing our appreciation. So uh, in the past, uh, we've always done a annual appeal letter. And I just wanna make it very clear that some of y'all will, will be receiving our appeal letter uh, in, in the next week or so. 
and the Giving Tuesday annual appeal, that is one drive. We're not trying to, to have two separate fundraiser, fundraising drives. So our first email on Giving Tuesday went out uh, on Friday, and we've already had three donations have come in, so thank you for that. Uh, in the past year's donations, in 2019, we built a uh, education pavilion out at Dove Skin. It's a big multi-purpose pavilion. It will give a place for when we have the school kids out there that they can eat lunch under it. It's a place, we got enough seats that you can put all the kids in seats and give them orientation before they start going to their different uh, uh, classes that we have set up, their different learning stations that we have. Uh, the pavilion was a great addition. Uh, trail maintenance takes money. Uh, paying for these apps that Jennifer's got. They're, they're great apps. Uh, we I've used them, my wife, we, we, we've used a, one of them out at Doe Skin. It's wonderful. But all of that stuff costs money. And a lot of times the friends winds up helping pay uh, for, for these apps. So uh, we do have needs. And, and as Paul is going to talk about in the future, we have some great plans. Uh, we have a strategic plan. There's a lot of growth going to happen. So yes, we, we need your help. Uh, we need you to help yourself by getting out to the refuge and join it. Help us help the kids. Uh, we got the kids fishing right there. Uh, help us help families. We got a lot of the junior ranger program. It's, it's a great activity for, for the family to, to come out with the kids and, and you work on the junior ranger program together. And remember, adults, you can get your Junior Ranger uh, badge also. You don't have to be a kid to get the badge. Uh, just one little thing that really strikes me. Uh, the thing I really like, being on the board has been a, wonderful. It's been a lot of fun. But really, the fun is getting out there and, and working with the public. And environmental ed is probably my favorite thing to do. And our, our goal with, with kids is to turn them into the next conservation hero. And just to see that one spark on a fifth grader or sixth grader, uh, when they have a pair of binoculars in their hands and they have not been able to focus on a the bird, there's a bird and they can't get it working. And, and you're sitting there, you're trying to help them. And you say, do you see it? Do you see it? And they're looking and looking. And then all of a sudden, bingo, their eyes pop open and say, oh yeah, there it is. You know, th that's, 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 that's the joy we're doing this. That's why we're doing this grunt work. It's not grunt work, but that's why we're working on this strategic plan, making the friends a better group. It's so we can get more and more kids out there, get them to spark, and maybe they'll be our next set of conservation heroes. So uh, thank you for your uh, support. Uh, we appreciate it. You can give online. You can, there's, if you get the letter, you can respond in an envelope. Uh, we would just appreciate your support, and we're trying to, uh, our fundraiser is going to kick off, uh, it's going to be finished on December 1st, that's Giving Tuesday, so we've got a lot of fun stuff happening, keep an eye on your email box, great things are happening, and we are shooting for a goal of $15,000 this year, so would you please help us out on that, and that's all I have to say, thanks to everybody, and we appreciate everybody's support in the past, thank you so much. Thank you, Fred. Yeah, uh, we, we we know that everybody's everybody's sending out their stuff right now. So just uh, give us a shout, give us a, a thought, and uh, and be generous. Uh, next up, Paula Richards. I call her our strategy czar. She's taken on our initiative for a long range five-year plan. This is something we've been working on for this year, something that uh, we've been trying to work on for, for a number of years. Uh, with many, many hours of work and meetings and meetings and work, we have our vision for the future. It is aggressive, but I think it embodies the aspirations of the community as a whole. And we're certainly hoping that it will spark your interest and uh, become a call to action. So, Paula, tell us all about it. All right, Wayne, thanks. Uh, there were an awful lot of people, an awful lot of hours that were put into this. 
Um, so I wanted to kind of start out and why, why did we do this now? And I think you've heard from Kelly, you've heard from Jennifer, things are evolving at the refuge. The environment in which we find the refuge is evolving with uh, urbanization. In fact, it's not just urbanization, but it's rapid urbanization and all the changes that brings. And COVID, you know, you add all that stuff together and it's really given us time to reflect. So rather than just, you know, hunkering down, we decided to act and use this quiet time, if you will, to really think about where we wanted to go as an organization. So when you look at that, you've got to understand clearly and honestly, where are we now? Where do we want to go? How do we think we need to get there? What are we going to need in order to help us get there? How are we going to know whether we've been successful along the way, et cetera? And basically, you know, with any plan, we plan, we execute, we assess, we fine tune, re re <laughs> rinse and repeat basically. So what we've tried to create here is mu very much of a living document um, that we will be updating on an annual basis to say, okay, are these still the right things we wanna focus on? Are we making good progress, et cetera? So I wanted to kind of take you through a high level view of this. At the heart of everything we do is the refuge. The refuge, its missions, its challenges, its successes, and, and the wildlife that it supports, the habitat it supports, et cetera. And kind of wrapped around this are you know, the heart and soul of the friends group, which our members and volunteers and our partnerships with organizations, which then allow us to do programs and projects and trails and activities. And obviously some of the stuff we do, just people can do it with sweat and tears, like we did with the trails, you know, and there was an amazing, I can't say enough about the, the new Warbler Vista Trail and what the um, experience was there. But some of the things we have to do does require money like making copies of the Junior Ranger uh, booklet, um, paying for buses to bring kids out on field trips. If you have a Title I uh, school that cannot afford a bus, the Friends Group actually sponsors the buses for some of these kids to come out. You look at the pavilion that we built, there's a lot of those kinds of things that you can't just do with you know, hard labor. You actually need to put some money on the table. And then kind of wrapped around this is the board itself. And I must admit the board has just impressed the heck out of me. They've looked at all our, our policies and procedures. They've ensured that where we've made changes to simplify, but to stay in full compliance, to stay within the regulations of nonprofit organizations, within the regulations of a friends group to a federal refuge. And part of this is encapsulated in our partnership agreement with the refuge. Um, so there's been a, a lot of work around all of this and I'm gonna take you through it very quickly with an expectation that I can pique your interest and you'll say, wow, that does look like fun. So we are reasserting who we are, what our mission is and what our vision is. You know, we're solely maniacally focused on supporting wildlife and habitat conservation at the refuge. That's easy. We're gonna, in addition to that, we're gonna look at the outreach to the public, helping them become more aware and appreciative of the refuge and what we try to do with spaces, wild spaces like the refuge, and ensuring that that habitat is uh, maintained and supported and conserved, as well as becoming advocates for the wildlife that we, you know, love so much and the wild spaces that we like to go out and enjoy. And then we wanted to reassert where do we see ourselves? And frankly, you know, we looked around and there's houses here, there's houses there, you know, the encroaching urbanization that's there, which is good because people need a place to live. But can we leverage that and say, what does the Friends organization look like in five to 10 years? How will it need to change to accommodate and leverage the, the new environment in which we find ourselves? So we're looking at things like diversity. We're looking at things like changing programs so that we can uh, draw a more of an urban crowd out to the refuge and have programs that are available to them when they need it, how they need it, and so forth. So we basically came up with some priorities. We felt that visitor services, obviously, that is the outreach to the public. That is everything from programs to activities. I think a lot of you have, have taken advantage of some of the activities we've had in the past 12 to 14 months where we did things like have the herpetologist come out, we had the birds of prey come out. And he, you know, I remember that because he had the screech owl sitting on the top of his head, <laughs> was really cute. Um, the environmental education programs, getting more trails up and running, making more of the refuge accessible to people and so forth. 
public outreach, getting the message out, um, whether it's you know, putting together a web presence strategy that touches more of the millennials and the Gen Xs and the Gen Zs. Uh, so we can then be on their smartphone and touch them and encourage them to come out and enjoy the, the, the refuge, as well as to support what we're trying to do from a habitat conservation and preservation perspective. And then there's all the work around conservation and stewardship. And this has changed a little bit because when the refuge was first founded, you know, the prices were not what they are today. And frankly, you know, you look at prices in Lago Vista encroaching this direction, prices coming from Marble Falls, coming from the other direction and so forth, the price of land has just skyrocketed. And it's driven by the demand from developers and this rapid urbanization. So we have to become smart about how we address conservation and stewardship. So yes, land acquisition and filling in that map that Kelly showed you, but it's also about land conservation so that if we can convince people to preserve the habitats, to protect the wildlife that's there, to make sure that we are not crowding out these wonderful animals that we share with, that we are providing um, the native plants and the grasses that are eminently well suited for the environment in which we find ourselves. Those kinds of messages and those kinds of programs are gonna be very important to us. And then the organizational capacity is the board itself. Do we have the right board members on board? Do we have the right skills in the board members? What about the friends group? I mean, the whole friends group, there's such a tremendous wealth of knowledge and experience and passion for nature there. How can we fully engage our members, get them involved and get them, you know, helping us with these kinds of things that we wanna focus on. So that was confirming our priorities. So just some quick examples in each one of these. So from a programs and visitors examples, you know, we want to continue doing all the great stuff that we're already doing. We want to continue with trails. We want to continue with environmental education. We want to continue with some of the outreach programs we're doing to schools, et cetera. But we also want to do more, right? We want to support the refuge sponsored programs. Like um, Jennifer mentioned, the new junior ranger program. We've baked into our budget for the coming years to get those copies made. We want to use that into um, things like nature activity backpacks which we've just kicked off a team under Cindy, who's gonna be working with a number of master naturalists to actually assemble these activity backpacks that can be used in a self-directed way by families who come to visit. Because they get out there with their kids and their kids are, you know, they're running along the trails, but to actually be able to use that as a teaching moment for kids. So we've done a lot of work and um, benchmarking ourselves against other refuges, benchmarking ourselves against other parks even libraries that have these nature activity backpacks that you can check out, use while you're on the refuge and then return. So those things though have to be created. The activity booklets themselves have to be created. And I would love to have some more teachers working with us on those kinds of things. Um, we've got a grant from the Highland Lakes Master Naturalist to do our first set of these, which is you know kudos and thank you very much for that. Um, but those are some of the things we wanna do uh, from an environmental education perspective. And then another really great um, project that we've already kicked off uh, using the leadership from our trails committee. Um, we're going to put together a hike leader training program where you'll actually get certified for that. Um, Jennifer has talked to the Balcones Canyonlands Preserve and they already have a similar program. We're going to build on what they've done and then customize it for the refuge and add some new and interesting topics we can add because what we have on the refuge and using the trail committee, people like Ryan and Dan and Evelyn and others, um, you know, to look at the, um, some of the very interesting hikes we could do on some of the closed tracks. So we would do these as guided hikes um, into areas that are not historically open to the public, but put these hikes out there, invite our donors, invite our members as first choice, and then take some of these hikes and really explore parts of the refuge that hitherto,fore you know, maybe only the refuge staff has been or the previous owner. So we've got some great stuff that's coming there as well from a programs and visitor services perspective. We're also gonna be doing a lot with public outreach. Um, you know, <laughs> we need to get with a program and I will confess I am a troglodyte, you know, using social media, I'm still stuck in Facebook. There's so many other, other opportunities out there to do that. Um, we need to, you know, bring the Friends of Balcones into this time frame from a technological perspective. 
Uh, we want to refresh the website. Uh, we're looking to get into much more social media. You may have noticed we're starting to publish more on Facebook. We've actually put together a social media calendar that we're going to be driving to. Uh, we also want to look at advocacy initiatives and partnerships to get other people to speak on our behalf. That's what I call a uh, partnering and getting the advocacy program. It's what I call a multiplier effect. So we can come forward with one voice, but if we come forward with our partners and you know those who are, are thinking along the same lines as we, we have a much stronger and a much louder voice. Um, so we wanna really make a, a strong focus on those kinds of things. And then we wanna do a reboot of our festivals. I mean, let's face it, Songbird Festival was kind of the quintessential birding festival. We had people come from all over the world to get their life birds here. Um, because we're such a special place for songbirds. Um, we want to reboot that, but we want to do it thoughtfully in how we do that and build on all of the good work that is done to date. And obviously it's going to be COVID dependent because if COVID you know, continues around, we're going to have to rethink how we do festivals of this size. And conservation and stewardship is obviously key because the land is the land. I mean, they're not making it anymore. So we want to look at the land and really put together some outreach programs for local landowners. From the local landers, we wanna take that into communities. I mean, I wanna take it into, I've already done this with my own POA, is we've done um, sessions with the local homeowners on native plants and how to protect the land and how to put in natural native grasses and wildflowers and really how to be stewards of your land, even if you don't have a ranch, even if you only have like, you know, one, five, 10 acres. Um, we also want to be making sure we keep an, um, a healthy reserve for land protection and acquisition. Monies need to flow into that as monies flow out. So we need to make sure we're focused on that and managing that appropriately. Um, with Ryan coming on board, uh, we've got someone who's got some really strong financial investment uh, skills. Uh, so we want to make sure we're managing that appropriately and hopefully growing it, uh, not just from donations. Um, and then we want to do a develop an advocacy program that builds on strong partnerships. Part of this is really learning from how we were able to do Peaceful Springs, learning from how we did Higginbottom, learning from how we are doing Crane, because what that was was a coming together of organizations who are like minded, like the Trust for Public Land, like the Nature Conservancy, like other groups and elected officials, local movers and shakers. And they all came together to help Peaceful Springs happen. Um, you know, we wanna do the same thing with other land tracks. When the refuge decides, this is one, this is where we wanna go, and we're gonna be right there with them, helping them to make that happen. Okay, nobody wants to talk about money, nobody wants to talk about fundraising, but you know, even a nonprofit organization needs money. And so we wanna implement a focused, multifaceted approach to really look across grants. We wanna do grants in a targeted way. So for example, the grant we got from Master Naturalist, even though it's only $500, that is enough to, to you know, create and jumpstart our whole activity backpack program. Um, we're looking for grants that have specific projects that are in sync with what we're trying to do with our strategic plan. So for example, we've applied to one for the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation to help us with this whole strategic plan process. We also want to look at, um, we also want to look at creating a project-based approach to fundraising. So for example, when we did the pavilion, um, people knew what they were giving for. And you know, if you've been out to see the Doe Skin Pavilion, it is phenomenal. The team did an absolutely wonderful job of getting it built with a contractor, with the refuge staff themselves, getting it built and installed. They did an excellent job. And it was the friends group that funded it. We came together, we saw a project, we knew the need was there and we acted on it. And there are a couple of more projects I'm gonna talk about later on that we've got kind of on our radar here. And then we wanna create a, a, a really robust donor program. And this is, a, you know, this is something that we as a board, we're still learning how to do that. So fortunately we have a consultant who's been working with us, who's had a lot of experience with boards and helping them for boards for nonprofits and helping them really get beyond the, the ask and building those relationships and nurturing them. So we're gonna do this with a lot of help from our friends. I started out with a little help from my friends and realized we need a lot of help from our friends because you on this call and the rest of our friends groups 
I mean, that you are why we are able to do what we can do. So without your passion, without your skill, without your, you know, raising your hand, holding your hand out, contributing, you know, we could not do any of what we're doing now. So what I'd like to ask you to do is to find your passion and volunteer. You all have skills. I know you do. You may not think you do, but you do. Share your skills and love of nature. You know, come and, and help us take the next step. We've got lots of opportunities. You know, if you want to, you know, get out in the wild and help with some of the trail work, we've got a terrific team of people who've been doing an amazing job there. Um, if you like native plants, uh, we've got a native plant garden around the headquarters, the visitor center, and around the entrance. Those kinds of things need tender, loving care. Not so much tender because they're native plants, so they're pretty rugged. Um, also helping out with the native, um, uh, the nature activity backpacks. You know, if you've got a background or a passion for helping children, you know, find themselves in nature. And they call it the vitamin N for nature. Um, if you write well, you know, helping us write grants, um, that would be very helpful. Um, if you've got some skills with web design, you know, we want to, you know, <coughs> excuse me, we want to reboot our website and bring it into the, the 2020s. We want to start creating nature videos because this may be the new normal of what we're doing now. And so we want to outreach and make sure we're fully exploiting the technology that's available for us. And I would also say feed your passion and get out in the wild. You know, learn about what you love. One of the things we're going to be doing is some training exercises like becoming a hike leader. We're going to have a, a series of programs where we're teaching people about the new um, areas of the refuge that we're going to be opening up. Um, share your passion, invite your fr friends and family, you know, get them out and help them enjoy the, the refuge as well. And membership does have its privileges. You know, you get early notification of special events. I mean, the last um, activity that um, Dave Bell and the activity team did, you know, it was a blowout. I mean, you know, within a couple of days, we had filled our allotted slot that, that would still keep us in compliant with COVID. But if you remember, you get early notification so that you can sign up and get one of the open slots. Okay, um, the future, we've got big plans. Um, we've got, you know, we know, we would know where we wanna go. We are gonna need a lot of help from our friends. We're gonna need some money to help make this happen. Well, we came up with some really big ideas. So we wanna to get to the point and quite frankly, Kelly and Jennifer help guide us in these ideas. So we want to get to a point where we have a calendar long, a year long calendar of events and programs and activities. So it's not just, you know, this little piece of the year, but it's that we keep a drumbeat going of interactions with mother nature out there. We want to grow the friends group to be a thousand strong. Now, remember this was a five-year plan, but we've got big dreams and we think we can do it. We think we need an executive director. So we would like to get an executive director on board. When we benchmark ourselves against other refuges and other nature centers and parks, et cetera, that's one of the things that keeps coming up is they've, had, they've got executive directors who really focus strongly on fundraising, program development, et cetera. We would like to get to a point where the visitor in nature's, a visitor in nature center are open on weekends. One way we can do that is have a mobile visitor center. And we've seen this in other uh, nature centers and other refuges where they have a uh, trailer like that they, you know, they will bring it to Doskin or they'll park it over at Werbler Vista and it will be manned from a certain period of time during the day, say 10 to three or whatever. And they will have maps. They will be able to give people um, information as well as that will be where they could check out an activity backpack for their kids. So we're trying to be creative here. Um, you know, someone asks about the Flying X. Well, we have a vision and the vision is, wouldn't it be cool if we could, you know, get rid of that money pit that Kelly's dealing with and put up an educational center at the Flying X where we can have programs. Um, we can do a lot of cool stuff, even maybe put in a nature center there. And we want to continue to protect lands through conservancies and advocacy program, as well as doing additional land acquisition. So we've got some really big ideas here. And I pulled in this picture of the Nature Center <clears throat> slash Visitor Center at Plano, Texas. Excuse me. <clears throat> um, this is actually a, a um, barn dominium that they created and turned into 
um, a nature center. And by the way, one of the grants comes from Mueller Building and Supply. And they will actually, if you win the grant, they will actually come and put up the building for you. You have to lay the foundation, but they will put the structure up for you. And then you need to do the finished work on the inside. So anyway, that's where we are from a strategic plan perspective. I'm gonna turn it back to Dave from a question perspective. Anybody have questions? Thanks, Paula. Um, I have a question from Erica Fitton and I, Truly apologize if I butchered the pronunciation. Uh, with fragmentation around the corner, how involved are cities around the, the refuge? Talking about development plans and land management. Well, that's a really good question. And I think we have a variety of relationships with the cities around us. Uh, Lago Vista is one that was very supportive of Songbird Festival and gave us grants to make that happen because they get, they call that hotel occupancy tax. Um, you know, they get taxed or they, they get monies because people come to the Songbird Festival. So it's a benefit from them. But on the other hand, you know, they are focused on development and they are focused on property taxes. Um, and so it's kind of a, it's a, it's a relationship we need to really do more to reach out to and maybe help shape them. And it really requires working from the city council and the economic development council perspective in, right? Because you need, you need to have those kinds of relationships and it's something we know we need to do. Okay, that's the only uh, question I see for you here at the moment, Paula. So, All right. Uh, yeah, you can, uh, you can give your voice a rest. Yeah, I can sit, kick back and relax here. All right, so I'm going to turn it back to Wayne. Okay, well, uh, no more. Well, we, you know, if you have any questions for for Dave, Fred, those they're open as well. So, thanks, Paula. Lots to look at for sure, but uh, definitely a roadmap for our organization and uh, for our our uh, our audience here, uh, remember that you can contact any board member at any time to get involved. Lots of opportunities to be a part of the effort. Uh, and as Paula says, you all have something to contribute. So uh, get involved, get after it, get to it, get her done. All right. So It's not an annual meeting without recognition of those that have been putting in uh, their time and effort. I'd like to take a few moments to list those contributors so that you know what's been going on. So first of all, refuge staff. Kelly, Jennifer, Chris. Uh, an extra super refuge management staff and just a wonderful group to work with. It's truly satisfying to see our work translate into good things on the refuge through their guidance. And, you know, we, we have a, uh, a kind of a mental image of the Fed and, uh, and listen, that, they blow it away. There's, they're, they're good folks, they're great to work with. Uh, you know, we're all after the same thing. And they want to get there just as much as we do. So thanks, Kelly, Jennifer, and Chris. Uh, next is our, our is our, our board of directors. Uh, Dave Bell, Vice President, Fred Zach, Secretary, Pat Wilkinson, Treasurer, Bill Hughes, Director, and Paula Richards, our strategies are. What a team so much has accomplished this year. We, uh, our work has evolved into a real friendship and camaraderie. The group dynamics is powerful. And I've said a lot, said before, just, just a lot of fun. It, it, it's great. Dave Bell headed up our governance committee and uh, our activities group, our activities committees, and uh, has just done an outstanding job. Fred, uh, initiated our financial policy committee or financial committee 
as well as the fundraising committee. Uh, lots of uh, lots of energy there. Lot, lot, lots of, of uh, good work. Pat Wilkinson is treasurer. Uh, you can't say enough about the people that that uh, take care of the books. There's a lot to it, and particularly being a nonprofit, keeping everything situated, organized, uh, is a big chore. Bill Hughes joined us uh, this year as a director and has been very instrumental in helping us with our first uh, newsletter and uh, with some of the uh, uh, the marketing aspects of our of our work. And of course, you heard Paula. The driving force for our strategic plan. Uh, we also have a great group of volunteers that filled in some committee slots. Bill Carr, membership. You know, we haven't had a membership chair for a couple of years. It's a big task. You know, the thing we, we need to be concerned with is the touches. We want our members to, to feel that they belong and that they're, they're part of the team. So membership is going through some changes and some improvements. Dan Nugent ran our, our trails uh, efforts, uh, keeping uh, everything uh, in, keeping everyone involved and uh, in the right direction. Mark McConaughey uh, took over for our, uh, as our wild apricot, our website uh, uh, specialist. He's been helped with Amanda Haverland, Rhonda Spray, Lynette Holtz, uh, Help us with our marketing, publicity, community outreach, as well as Evelyn Nugent. Uh, there's been some efforts what's called the Cow Creek Project that uh, uh, is, is all part of that uh, catchment area. And Jack Smith, uh, hey, just, you know, uh, a, a set of eyes that, uh, that, that gave us a lot of direction and uh, a, a lot of advice. There have been a, a number of other individuals that played a, a big part in our successes this year. Albert Zarate uh, kind of brought us into maybe the 20th century as far as uh, our website. Still a lot, a lot of room to go. Cindy Harding Woolhall has, has been active with our education programs. We rely on Shelby Bates every now and then if we have a legal question with uh, whatever we're doing. Anita Roney uh, provided some input on our finances and Carol Phillips and uh, some, some thoughts and uh, considerations for our marketing project. So a lot of uh, uh, one more, one more uh, contribution a lot of what we have accomplished was through the guidance of Kathy Allen, our board director. Uh, she's pushed us through our efforts, set in on our committee meetings, provided advice to many changes and implementations that we are confident will make our plans achievable. So thank you, Kathy. Okay, we're getting down to the, to the end of it here, folks. So. We want to recognize four individuals that embody the spirit of the Friends Group. First is Sharon Makett. I hope I pronounced her name correctly. Sharon retired this year after running the very successful Songbird Fest. Always in uh, the Songbird Fest was always anticipated uh, for, and she ran it for for 20 years. Uh, such great events are well organized and a landmark gathering for, for birders from everywhere. Next is Pat Wilkinson. Pat served as treasurer for the last eight years. Always a thankless task, but essential, essential nonetheless. Pat, thank you for so many years keeping the books, managing the budgets, and of course paying the bill. Paula Richards. You've heard her before. Our volunteer of the year, unanimously, unanimously selected by everyone 
working on a strategic plan. Hands down, many hours of work, many, many emails, a lot of arm twisting went into our long range plans. But this is our guidebook. You got a good view of that and a real coup in our goals as a friends group within the Fish and Wildlife Service organization. Can't say enough for, for the work that, that she did. Lastly, we want to recognize Joanne Mukherjee. Uh, she's our, been our environmental advocate for conservation and land acquisition. She's led efforts to preserve our natural surroundings and increase the footprint of the refuge catchment area. Joan has been a champion for everything that's good for Balcones Canyon lands. Thank you, Joan. Okay, again, thanks to everyone for your time, contributions for the greater good for those passing in our footsteps. We have much to be proud of. There is a lot at stake, a lot of challenges to our environment as we know, but I'm confident that with everyone's help as an active and unified front, we can keep our wild places. So thanks again, everyone. It's been a real pleasure. So I'm going to turn the dais over to Dave Bell. Uh, this is a members only section because we're going to have a vote. So Dave. Thanks, Wayne. Uh, this is the business part of the uh, annual meeting. And what, um, what I'm going to do here is to propose that uh, we, we vote on the adoption of the new bylaws. Now, uh, if you are not a member, please don't vote. This is, uh, at the moment, we have uh, 28 participants in this meeting, uh, which means that uh, a majority will be required of 14 people to pass this this uh, initiative and the uh, discussion period has been open on this for eight days and I appreciate and thank you for all the people who sent in comments, questions, what have you. And I um, attempted to answer to all of them over that eight day period. So this, this new set of bylaws, the question, the question is, do we vote to, number one, rescind the old bylaws, and number two, replace them with the new ones? That is all one question, but it's important because the, the new bylaws are not a rewrite. They are completely new and written from scratch. So we, we have to include in the question, do we want to rescind the old ones? Anyway, um, these bylaws were developed over a period of about six or seven months. It took a lot of, a lot of effort, uh, a lot of coordination with Kathy Allen and the governance committee a lot of hand wringing, God knows how many rewrites. And in order for us to become, to become um, more streamlined and consistent with the strategic plan, we are going to now ask the members to vote on this issue. It has been put before the board of directors and unanimously supported by all members of the board. So um, we ask for your approval. Um, Paula, you wanna put up the polling slide? Now in this, in this um, polling slide that you see on the screen now, you actually have to answer three questions and two of them are just for um, demographics. 
And uh, for, for our own information on, on the board, the, the, the number three is the bylaws vote. So you have to, you have to make a vote for all three issues, vote or um, just select one of the uh, circles in all three issues and then hit submit. We're gonna keep this open for a few minutes, give everybody a chance to, uh, to look at it. And uh, if you would please go ahead and uh, begin voting on it. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. While uh, you're uh, mulling over the big question, uh, let me just give you a few reminders. November 27th, that's the day after Thanksgiving, we have our opt-out hike. Uh, we're trying to get uh, four of those, uh, two at, at uh, Doe Skin and two at Warbler Vista. Uh, so put that on your calendar. December 1st, Giving Tuesday. Don't, don't, now you don't have to wait till December 1st, but uh, just remember uh, that is the big day. And then, of course, January 1st, we have our first day hike. Uh, you know, a couple of things that we've done in the past, Sparrow Fest, uh, we're, we're, uh, we're, we're, we're trying to work something up on that. Uh, it, it, uh, will, it will not be an in-person thing that we've done at Flying X in the past. Uh, Songbird Fest, as Paula indicated, you know, we're, we're going to have to reboot on that. Again, uh, not a, not a, not enough knowledge as far as the, the COVID crisis. So, does anybody have anything else that they would like to add at this time? Are we done with the balloting? I can't see uh, on my screen. I cannot see the results, Wayne. So uh, I'll ask Paula if she has them there. All right. So can you hear me okay now? Yes. All right. So we're all learning Zoom. <laughs> all right. So we have. Um, so far, we have 17 people who have voted. So let me just give you a countdown five from five to zero. And by that time, you will have needed to vote for all three. Um, the questions are pretty easy. So five, four, three, two, one. All right, the polling has now ended. The bylaws have passed by 100% unanimous. Um, the other questions we said, how often have you been to the refuge this year? 47% um, have been there one to five times. And then it's sort of spread between six to 10 times and more than 10 times. And then the request for a call in all friends meeting uh, that was the vote that won there for twice a year. And that's at 41%. And then it's fairly evenly split. Um, you've got once a year, 29%, three times a year, 12%, and quarterly, 18%. So it's definitely one or two times a year. Can you, um, Dave, can you see the results? No, I don't see them. Okay, well, I'm going to save the results and I'll send them out to everybody. Okay, thank you. And thanks for thanks to everyone for voting. All right, any final words, Wayne? Well, all I'm going to do is say thanks to everyone for your attendance, for your attention. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. We always welcome your questions, your comments, your concerns. Contact us at any time. Uh, I guess the next thing will be to ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. I second. And there's a second. So all in favor. Aye. 
Any opposed? Thanks, everyone. We really appreciate. We really appreciate you. So, come see us. Paula, I think, uh, would it be okay if we unmuted and let people say goodbye as they're leaving? Absolutely. Let's unmute everybody. I'm going to unmute everybody. Hopefully everybody's unmuted. If anybody would like to add anything or say anything, we'd love. We're so glad everybody was here today. I'm going to start my video up too so y'all can see who's talking at you instead of a, a faceless body or a voice, a faceless voice. <laughs> so what a neat picture that one is too. Well, this picture is actually from um, Melissa Cheatwood, I think. Okay. At least it came from her folder. So I think this is uh, from up, I, this looks like it's from up on Rimrock, isn't it? Yeah, yeah probably. Yeah. yeah, it is Rimrock. I've been there. Yep. All right. Well, thanks everyone so much. I am going to stop the recording. Um, so we should be good to end this call. So Paula, one thing, will, th will this 